Well, if you haven't felt the prick of the conviction of sin over the last few weeks, perhaps it will happen today. Because today we are entering into a part of the Sermon on the Mount which seems to have been most eroded in our culture. We have talked about hatred, and yes, people do hate. We have talked about lust, and yes, people do lust. But even though we do those things, we acknowledge them as wrong. We might excuse it and say everybody does it. But when it comes to our words and the promises that we make, words have become pretty cheap. And it is a systemic problem throughout our entire culture. Whereas at one time, a handshake was enough to seal a pact. Now, you need things notarized you need a lawyer to look it over to make sure that the language it doesn't have any loopholes in it, so that should something go wrong, you can find an easy way out. Whether it be in buying a car or a house, or whether it's getting married. And I commend Prince Harry for not wanting to sign a prenuptial agreement with this woman that he is going to marry this spring. His intention is that there will be no divorce. I hope that's true. Because in our culture, our word really doesn't have any value. If you look at our government, for instance, it is a crime to lie to the FBI. If you lie to the FBI under oath, you can go to jail. That's kind of a holdover from those days when a handshake was as good as your word. However, when the FBI is lying, there's all kinds of, of uh, squirming that goes on, all kinds of iterations trying to justify it. Well, we're not really lying, we're simply shaping the story. We're not really leaking, we're simply getting information out that we feel people should know. And if somebody does it, instead of thinking about whether he should go to jail, we're thinking about whether he should keep his pension or not. That's where we have come with regard to the value of the word. When you think about marriage, it's no better in the church than it is in the world. People are divorcing at an extremely high rate. I've lived here in Wapaka for 12 years in April. And I don't even have enough fingers and toes to count the people, the couples, that I have known that have fallen apart and have divorced within those 12 years. And I have to tell you, I don't know many people outside of churches. But we're talking about people that proclaim that they are Christians. They have been redeemed, they've been forgiven, and they are passing the peace with their spouse every day, right? Well, apparently not. And it's no big deal, because if you end up divorcing and the church doesn't like it, well, you just find a different church. People will accept that. Not a problem. I've seen it too often. And Jesus is going to call us out on this. And so I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will kind of prick us just a little bit. Not so that we feel really badly, but so that we can understand what forgiveness is really all about. And that's really what Jesus is doing. He's presenting the law in its full power so that we can experience the conviction of sin. 
Because without the conviction of sin, we cannot experience God's grace. Here's the letter of the law, verse 31. Jesus says, Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. In Matthew 19, 7, the, the Pharisees asked Jesus, Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus gave a similar answer. And, and they said, well, well, then why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and for, to put her away? Well, I, I just read the entire Pentateuch, and nowhere in the Pentateuch, the five books of the law, does it command a man to divorce his wife, nor does it command a certificate of divorce. What it does is assume that men will sin. And the only place where I saw the certificate of divorce of divorce uh, mentioned was if a man divorces his wife he protects her that certificate of divorce is a is a validation that it's not her fault she did nothing legally wrong to cause the divorce so it puts shame on him and so she is allowed to then enter through society even though she's been married and divorced, put away, she's protected. It also protects her in, in that it says that if she does divorce, if he divorces her and then she marries somebody else and that somebody else divorces her, she can't go back to the first husband according to the law. God calls that a pollution of the land. So that's the context. But Jesus is now raising the bar. He says, I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So that's raising the bar. And today, that's happening so often that we have just kind of overlooked it. It's not a big deal anymore. Everybody's doing it. But I think Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is, is telling us this is a big deal. And it's not a big deal in its own sense, but for a couple of reasons. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Malachi 2.16 says, For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Now, the problem is, some of us are in that spot. Or we know somebody who's in that spot. We've been divorced and we've remarried and it really wasn't a very good reason, except maybe he, he irritated me or something. I don't think the, the issue is to, uh, to beat ourselves up over this or to try to undo what's been done. But the question arises, are we ready to acknowledge our sin? That's really the question. And here's why it's so important. Marriage is an illustration. It's an illustration of God's relationship with us. He is our husband. We, the church, are his bride. And when we so easily cause divorce to occur and we allow it to occur, we are defaming the name of the Lord. Jeremiah 3.1 says, They say if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and become another man's, may, she, may he return to her again? Would, that, 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 would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. What is your image of God? Is he a God far away that doesn't care about you? Is he somebody who maybe created the world, set it in motion, and then left it alone? Or is he somebody who is intimately involved in every aspect of your life? 
Is he so involved that you have no control of your life? Do you have a fatalistic approach? Like, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, both of those ideas are actually unbiblical. God is not far away. He didn't create the world, set it in motion, and leave it alone. But neither is he so in charge, so sovereign, that you have no responsibility. Instead, he is like a husband, and you are like a wife. It's kind of like a dance. I've been taking dance lessons with my wife for the last couple of years. Who leads the dance? I do. Who follows? My wife does. Does that mean that my wife does absolutely everything that I try to lead her to do? No. There are times when I end up stepping on her feet. There are times when she misunderstands what I'm trying to get her to do and she doesn't twirl when I want her to. She is her own person. But I'm trying to lead her. I believe that is a good illustration of how it is with God. It is possible for us to sin within the context of God's sovereignty. We are responsible for our behavior. But that doesn't mean that we have somehow been disqualified from the dance. We are still his dance partners. He is still trying to lead us, even now. Even though we have really messed up our lives. That's the illustration that marriage is. And that's why God holds it so dear. Now Jesus moves on and he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. And then Leviticus 19.12 says, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. So, Jesus says, you shall not swear falsely. That's to make a promise. I swear that I will do something. You see, all promises that you make, even if they're not made to God, because they're made in God's presence, because God is everywhere, it is as if the promise was made to God. And people used to know this, especially the Christians knew this. And that's why people were as good as their word. We've forgotten it, and we've done all kinds of things to, uh, to justify bad behavior with regard to our promises. To profane something, which was mentioned in Leviticus 19.12, that word simply means to make common or to corrupt. Something was holy, and now it is not. It has been profaned. The name of the Lord is holy. The name of Jesus Christ is holy. Which means that your title as Christian is holy. And it's our responsibility to live up to that name, to keep it holy. Jesus goes on and he says, But I say to you, do not swear at all. Now, swearing takes on different names, doesn't it? We think of cursing as swearing, but actually he's talking about making an oath, making a promise, and invoking somebody else's authority on us. So when we go to court, we put our hand on the Bible and says, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Well, if you do that, you'd better tell the whole truth. Because Jesus is saying that to not do so is to profane the name of the Lord. 
Proverbs 20, 25 says, It is a snare for a man to devote rashly something as holy, and then afterward to reconsider his vows. So if you make a vow to God, make sure you're thinking clearly about what you're going to do. Whether it's putting money in the offering, whether it's making a commitment to serve somewhere, these are things that as you promise to God, you want to fulfill them. We read in Ecclesiastes this morning that we should let our words be few. Better to not say anything than it is to say something and not follow through on what you said. And it takes humility because our tendency is to keep let our mouth rattle off, to think that we are proud enough that we can follow through on whatever it is that we promise rationally. Jesus gives us reasons why we should not swear. And he says, first of all, don't swear by heaven, for it is God's throne. Don't swear by the earth, for it is footstool. Don't swear by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. We don't have access to the holy. And if we don't have access to the holy, we shouldn't be swearing by that which is holy. And God's presence makes us holy. Therefore, we need to live like it. We don't want to invoke God as a witness, because if we do that, it implies that we cannot be trusted. I swear to God and hope to die is one of the things that I grew up hearing and saying. Well, do we really? But why are you swearing to God? Why is your word so untrustworthy that you have to say, believe me? We should always be able to believe you if it's true, if your word is worthy. But we're also not supposed to even swear by our own selves. Jesus says, nor shall you swear by your own head because you cannot make one hair white or black. We don't even have control of our own selves. James 4, 15, 14 and 15 says, For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So again, this takes humility to be able to say, if the Lord wills, we will do something. You know, it, it, it really does take humility to acknowledge that we don't know it all. Sometimes we run into people that really do think they know it all. And proof is kind of in the pudding over time. I, I want to contrast two people that were considered geniuses. One is Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein had a certain humility about him. And even though he was one of the greatest thinkers that ever lived, he understood that he didn't know it all. And he gave room for God to exist and to move and to act in, on his creation. Now, he understood that God set certain rules in motion, and it was our responsibility and our joy and pleasure to find those rules. And he came up with some, the laws of relativity. I'd like to contrast that with another man, Stephen Hawking, who had no such humility. And he was also a brilliant mind, but he hated God and rejected his existence and toward the end of his life especially, was coming to a place where uh, he, he was acting by faith in his statements as opposed to looking at observed truth, scientific truth. And one of the things that, that was a hallmark of his theories was the idea of dark matter. And the dark matter supposedly explained all of the things that hold the universe together. We couldn't see it necessarily, but there's evidence for it in terms of the physics. And the greatest evidence of the dark matter was found in black holes. Black holes were supposedly at the center of the, uh, of the galaxies. 
And our Milky Way has a black hole, he said. Well, one of the ways that you can tell just how well uh, somebody thinks and whether their theories are very good is how they hold out over time. And Albert Einstein's theories have held out pretty well over time. One day after Stephen Hawking died this week, I read in the technology and science section of the Fox News, we don't have a black hole in the center of our galaxy. The data was read wrong. And I have to ask myself, was it coincidence that that came out one day after Stephen Hawking died? Did they just now discover that? Or is that something they knew but were holding off on until he died so that they didn't hurt his feelings or something? I don't know the answer to that. But we now need to rethink everything Stephen Hawking said because his, uh, his, his main evidence for his theory has just been debunked. We don't have control of the earth, yet, but we do have control of our own mouths. Jesus says, let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Exodus 20, 16 says, You shall not bear witness, false witness, against your neighbor, or to be trustworthy. So how do we keep our speech pure? I've got three things for you. First of all, avoid profanity. Yes, that means avoid cursing. It means avoid dirty language. But it also means avoid meaningless banter. And it means avoid slander and gossip. Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. I'll tell you what, if that doesn't scare you, nothing will. You're going to be exposed. Everything that you've ever said, every idle word, we're going to have to give an account for. Next, instead of standing on your own promises, stand on God's. Speak the word of God to one another. As the apostle says, talk to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make us good? See, God has made some certain promises to us. And those promises are as good as gold. I just wrote down a few of them for you, okay? God is with us. He draws near to us when we draw near to him. He loves us with an everlasting love. And he has adopted us to be his children. He strengthens us with his Holy Spirit. And he answers prayer according to his will. God protects us. And God forgives us. God leads us. And God is going to take us to heaven. These are promises. And they're as good as the man who made them. And that man is Jesus Christ. He cannot lie. He is going to fulfill these promises. Stand on them. Don't stand on your own word. And then finally, give God glory. Psalm 115.1 Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. So how do we give glory to God? Well, first of all, we give glory by acknowledging our sin. When we acknowledge our sin, we are telling God he's right. And we're letting go of those things that we have held on to. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how anger and hatred are things that we can hold on to and prevent us from really experiencing the fullness of God. I'll tell you a story real quickly. There's somebody in my life that betrayed me, lied to me, 
stole something very important from me, and I was angry at him. I was bitter at him. And I honestly, any time I thought of him, I wanted him to die. I'm confessing this as sin. And it was taking a hold of my heart. And it wasn't until I was able to recognize my role in that whole circumstance and acknowledge my responsibility and my sin that I was able to let go of that bitterness and that anger toward him. This really does work. If you acknowledge your sin and confess it to God, he really will forgive your sin. And he really will cleanse you from unrighteousness. Whether it be in that anger, or whether it be in lust, or whether it be in your speech. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is true. And I know that Jesus is exposing these sins to us, not to make us feel bad, but because he loves us and he wants us to be healed. So, Lord, we confess we are sinners. And we ask you to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to experience that newness of life that you would make available to all those who put their trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.